on this Palm Sunday. We are in Mark chapter 11, beginning in verses 12 to 24. As, as we approach this week, the, the Holy Week, uh, it's, it's like an annual pilgrimage for us where we remember the, all, the, all the things that are familiar, the, the joy of Passover, and, as well as the rising tension of the Lord's Supper and of the betrayal of, of Judas and of the arrest and uh, of the, the sting of, of death Friday afternoon and the disappointment that came with that. And then, of course, the great joy that comes on Sunday morning when the women go to the tomb and find that the stone has been rolled away and Jesus, of course, has, has risen from the dead. My, my prayer is that today, as, as we enter into this story of Holy Week, that we would hear this with fresh ears, that we would, as if hearing it for the first time. And this morning, we are going to focus on Palm Sunday as well as the next day, Monday, Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey to the shouts of the crowds. He said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then the next morning, Jesus went back into the city. And that's where we pick up in Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 12. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand as we hear from the Lord. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it, and they came to Jerusalem. And as he entered the temple, he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to eat, carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house should be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away at its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look! The fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In our series in Mark, we have asked questions like, you know, why why do we follow Jesus? Especially in times when we experience things that are unexpected. Uh, Why why do we follow Jesus and and how do we follow him? Is the question that we've talked about. And and Mark's gospel tells us that the reason that we should follow Jesus is because of who he is. Because he is the powerful king for whom nothing is impossible. Who is at work in our lives to accomplish is good and perfect purposes. And it also tells us that Jesus is the humble king, the one who comes not to serve, but to, to, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so today, as, as we come to this passage, the question that we ask is, is, what does the Lord expect from us at this time? You know, what are our responsibilities in light of all of these events that are swirling around us? Uh, what does the Lord want us to do? How does he want us to respond uh, to all of this? And so we're going to look at this passage, and we're going to see uh, Jesus' response to his situation and, and learn how we should respond to ours. And so this morning, we're going to look at these three things, the, the robber's den, the lesson from the fig tree, and how both of these point to the true temple. And so let's start with, with the robber's den, beginning in verse 15. The text says that they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple. And of course, Jesus would have been coming from Bethany, we know from the surrounding passages, and he would have come down the Mount of Olives into the eastern gate of the city, which is called the Golden Gate. Beautiful, the beautiful temple uh, was at the eastern edge of, of the city, and so he would have gone directly into uh, this temple that was the highest point in Jerusalem next to the Mount of Olives. And because it was Passover, the temple would have been 
very crowded. Josephus tells us that there would have been upwards of two million people that came to Jerusalem during the Passover, and so it would have been filled with people. Passover at the temple was, was kind of like Black Friday for us. It was a, a time uh, when, when the merchants filled the court of the Gentiles, says the text, which was a very large area that surrounded the temple. Josephus again writes about that and tells us that it was a, about a 35-acre area that was surrounded with these marble columns that were 35 feet tall. It's a huge area. And it would have been filled with merchants who were selling sacrificial animals that, had, that were certified. People could bring their own animal, but very often they would choose to buy an animal that had already been approved for sacrifice. It would have also been money changers because people were coming from all over the, the known world and would have had to exchange their, their currency into the local currency. And so you can imagine the, the amount of commerce, the hustle and the bustle, and you can also imagine the markup that, that people were making a lot of money here. And so could any of this be called worship is the question. And Jesus shows us here his, his response to what he saw beginning in verse 15. He says, Jesus began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house should be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. How did Jesus identify his father's house? He, he called it a house of prayer for all the nations, quoting Isaiah. The, the temple was supposed to be a place of worship, a, a, a gathering place for all peoples to come and, and pray and, and come and, and hear from the Lord and come and, and receive forgiveness. And this was to be for, for everyone. You know, some of the Jews wrongly thought that the Messiah would come and purge the temple of, of foreigners that uh, somehow that he, would, that he would send them away. And yet, in actuality, what does the Messiah do? He comes and he, he clears the temple for the foreigners. He, he makes a place for them. And so we see that the Father's house is to be a place of generosity and a, a place of, of holiness at the same time, that it's, it's to be a place of blessing for the nations. It's not something that's to be hoarded. Uh, it's not something that uh, should, should be... Um, that the Jews should hold to themselves, but rather something that should be shared. But he says here, but, but you have made it a den of robbers. And what does he mean by that exactly? Some think that perhaps he's referring to the commercialism of the temple, that, that they were making money, that they were profiting from these pilgrims who had come to worship. And certainly that, that's part of it. I think that there is a sense in which the temple had become a robber's den. It was a place where they were making a lot of money. But I think it's also true that the Jews were treating the temple as if it were, it was their robber's den. That they viewed the temple as a place where they could, could, could go and, and hide out. Where they could go and, and meet the requirements and, and, and then um, somehow uh, find refuge in, in what they had done. And so in that sense... Uh, it had become a robber's den. And Jesus says no to all of this. He begins to drive away the money changers and he, he sets the pigeons free that were intended to be sacrificed. And so you can imagine the scene. Now, what, what kind of king is Jesus? And when we step back and, and we look at the, 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 the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, and we look at what happens the next morning as he goes to clear the temple, we see these two very different perspectives of Jesus that that he is, uh, at the very same time, one who is uh, a, a, a king who, who comes uh, not riding on a war horse, but rather he comes on a donkey. He comes to bring peace to the city. Uh, and so we see the humility, and we see that, that Jesus is a different kind of king. He's a king who brings peace. And, but we also see that the, the zeal of Jesus, the zeal for your house will consume me. And so we see in him a a holiness. Uh, we see humility and we see holiness. We see the lion and we see the lamb. Uh, John talks about this in Revelation, that uh, he was directed by the Spirit to, to look into the throne, and, and he was instructed to look for the lion of the tribe of Judah, uh, the root of David, who triumphed, and he would open the scroll with the seven seals. But then when he looked, what he actually saw was, was one who had the appearance of a lamb who was slain who was standing at the center of the throne. 
And so we, we learn from Scripture that Jesus is the lion and he is the lamb. And we see that here on, on the opening days of Holy Week, that he is both, that he is the, the holy lion of Judah who comes to conquer, and he is also the lamb who was slain for our sins. He's majestic and he's humble. He's justice and he's gracious. He's sovereign, and yet he's willing to submit to the Father and all that he does. And so the, the robber's den uh, gives us an insight into um, what was happening in the temple, what was really happening. We then have this encounter, this curious encounter with the fig tree. And uh, we read in verse 20, as they passed by in the morning, they saw that the fig tree had withered away at its roots, the fig tree that Jesus had cursed. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus was hungry, and it was not the season for figs necessarily. Uh, uh, and yet uh, he, he, he curses the fig tree. You know, why, why does he do this? Why does he curse the fruitless tree? Uh, was he having a bad day? You know, was, he, was, was the pressure getting to him? Well, when you dig a little deeper, you, under, you begin to understand what's really happening here, that actually the fig trees in the Middle East have two seasons. There's a, the main season is in the summertime. But there is a, a shorter season in the spring where they would bear figs, the, the, a smaller kind of fig. And so here Jesus sees a, a fig tree by the side of the road and is filled with leaves, but there are no figs, the smaller figs that should have been there. And so he curses the fig tree. And really what he's doing is he's not so much uh, cursing it in that moment, but rather he's proclaiming that it's already cursed. He's proclaiming that here's a tree that, that ought to be bearing fruit and it's not. And so he, he proclaims uh, what is already true, that it's cursed. Uh, and so he, what was Jesus teaching his disciples in this moment? He was teaching them that, that Israel was, was like the barren fig tree. This is exactly what Jesus encountered as he was going into Jerusalem and as people were, were, were issuing praises to him, and yet he knew what was coming. He knew that by Friday they would turn away from him. He went to the temple and what did he see? He saw the empty praises of people. He saw a lot of activity, a lot of commotion, a lot of busyness, but there was no real substance. Uh, there, 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 was, uh, there was no, uh, there was no a real substance to what was happening here. And so what we see is that the fig tree uh, is, a, is a metaphor uh, that, that shows us that, that not all who claim to be God's people uh, are God's people unless they bear fruit for him. And that's what he sees in the temple, that he, even though the temple was magnificent and beautiful, and even though the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they knew all the answers and, and they looked good on the outside, the truth was there were no figs. There was no fruit in their lives. And, and so here I think that, that, that you know, the, the question that we should ask is, well, you know, what about us? You know, do, do, do we bear fruit? Um, do, do we, are we guilty of the same thing? Are, are there lots of transactions taking place around us, and, and yet there is no real substance? Are we truly worshiping? You know, was there any prayer that's actually taking place in our lives? Uh, are, there, are, there, are there actually sacrifices that, that are being offered with faith, which is what should have been happening at the temple? You know, is holiness increasing on the part of the worshiper, or are we just simply going through the motions? Was forgiveness truly being extended in a genuine sort of way or, or not? You know, was, was God's glory and fame and honor increasing and being extended or, or, uh, or not? And so the text begs the question of fruitfulness. And I think that's the lesson of the fig tree. The lesson of the fig tree is that you will know the tree by its fruit. Jesus is saying here, I want more than busyness. I want genuine worship that comes from a changed heart. And so the question is, where, where, do, we, where do we find this, this changed heart, this transformation? And the, both the, the robber's den and, and the fig tree, the withered fig tree, point us to the true temple that, that is coming. And we, we pick up again in verse 15. It says that he entered the temple. He began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the money tables and, he, and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And in verse 16, he says, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. 
You know, some think that this means that Jesus stopped all of the traffic that was going through the temple. Some think that it was a thoroughfare or a shortcut in and out of the city. And yet I think Mark's emphasis here is that he stopped all of the activities within the temple. He, he stopped the sacrifices from taking place. He drove out the sellers and the money, the money changers. And all four Gospels record this event to show that Jesus is signaling the end of an era. And he's showing the, that uh, the temple era is coming to a close. You know, for centuries, blood sacrifices had been offered in the temple for the forgiveness of sins. But the problem was they had to be repeated year after year, over and over again. And what, what did all of these sacrifices anticipate? They anticipated the final sacrifice. You now he would put an end to all of the sacrifices. You know, we saw this in our study in Genesis, that Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which some think was a fig tree, by the way. And then they experienced the death that comes from sin, separation from God. And they then were banned from the garden. And if you remember from our study that God placed the angels who had the flaming swords at the garden gate to prevent Adam and Eve from coming back in. And so the only way to come back into God's presence, God's temple, was to pass under the sword. And, uh, to, to, it was, and of course, then we have the sacrifices who passed under the sword, uh, the atoning the sacrifices that were offered and there is no forgiveness about the shedding of blood. And of course, that all pointed to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, who was willing to pass under the sword for us uh, in order that we might enter into God's presence. Jesus is the Passover lamb that was slain for all of God's people. And so the, the withered fig tree stands as a sign that the old way to approach God is going away. And that true religion for the Jew and the Gentile, for all of us, is through faith in Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the, the true temple that, uh, that Jesus predicted that he would raise up in three days in John chapter 2, verse 19. You know, that, that's why in verse 22, Jesus answered them and said, have faith in God. Have uh, trust in him because he is the one who will show us the way to this new temple, this, this new way of forgiveness, this new and, and more authentic way that will lead to life. And so what does the Lord then want to produce in his disciples, through, in a time, especially in a time like this? What, was, what, what did Jesus teach his disciples in that moment that would apply to us in this moment? And I want us to focus on two things that emerge from this vibrant faith from believe, having faith in God. And the first one is a powerful and effective prayer life that he says in beginning in verse 21, truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea. And if he does not doubt in his heart, but believes that, that it will be done, that it will come to pass, then it will be done for him. And what's interesting is that this, uh, this mountain that he was referring to was very likely one of the mountains, uh, was very likely the Mount of Olives, and the sea that he's referring to is probably the Dead Sea that's about 20 miles away. And uh, of historical note is the fact that Herod the Great, who was the ruler at the time, had taken one of the mountaintops of the southern part of Jerusalem and had essentially moved that, that mountaintop in order to create his fortress, Herod's fortress, which uh, was a spectacular structure. And so that was something that all of the, the inhabitants of Jerusalem were familiar with. And so here Jesus is alluding to that. He's saying that the earthly king is able to move the mountaintop, but the king of kings will move, can move the entire mountain. You know, he, he is the one for whom nothing is impossible. Uh, the creator of all things, uh, the, the powerful God who created everything, is the one who can, can move mountains. He's the one who can make a way when there seems to be no way. He, he's the one who can, can, uh, can cure the incurable. Uh, he's the one who can change the incorrigible can change even the human heart. Uh, and how does he do that uh, it, it, within us? He does it uh, by the work of his spirit through faith. It's guided by faith. That's why he says, believe, have faith in God who is able to do this, who is able to move the mountain. 
And as you look at scripture, you see example after example of God's people who have trusted in him in, in hard moments that, that affect the, the, you see the power of effective prayer that, that is offered by faith. Uh, the, the walls of Jericho came down because Joshua and the people trusted God and prayed. Uh, Job was protected in the midst of his trials, ultimately because he looked to God in faith. Uh, the muzzle of, of, the ma- of the lion's mouths were, the lion's mouths were muzzled, rather, in, in, in Daniel's uh, lion's den uh, because of the faith and, of Daniel and the faithfulness of God who closed the mouths of the lion. You know, at, at this time, when we face uh, our mountains, when, when we face things that are scary, like this time of, of, of coronavirus, when we are struggling with, with what's going to happen next, and how are we going to survive all of this? And what if I get sick? And, and what about my loved ones? And what about the economy? You know, so many questions that we don't have the answers to right now. Where do we go with all of these? We, we should run to the, fo- the feet of Jesus, the, the one who, uh, who, who comes to us and, and reveals his divinity to us uh, and, and shows us the way to the true temple. You know, we, we should... Believe and trust in him. And so num- the first thing that Jesus expects from us is a powerful and effective prayer life uh, because of who Jesus is. And then the second thing that he's, he emphasizes here is a loving and forgiving heart that uh, we ought to forgive those who, who come to us, who are in our lives. You know, why, why, why is this important? Uh, because if you retain a, a stubborn and bitter, unforgiving heart, then... Uh, then, and, and, and don't forgive others, then you are like the fig tree that is bearing no fruit, that a lack of forgiveness on our part hinders our prayers, is what the text says. And therefore, we ought to be people of forgiveness because we have been forgiven, because God has loved us first. And so these two fruits, forgiveness and love and, and prayer offered in faith, ought to be the the fruits that characterize our lives as Christians who have entered into genuine worship under the new temple, under Jesus, who is our true true temple for all the nations, Jew and Gentile. And so how how does this passage speak to us as those who are struggling, as those who are making our way through this challenging time? I think one of, the, one of the things that it tells us is don't, don't treat your faith like a robber's den. Don't merely go through the motions of worship. Don't merely sit there in, in your living room going through the motions of worship without engaging your heart and your mind and your spirit, without genuinely confessing your need for the Lord, without, without genuinely coming to him and, 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 and laying your burdens at his feet and trusting in his ability to move the mountains in your life, trusting that he is the one who is able Trusting that he is the one who sees the end from the beginning, that that uh, he is the one who ordained all of this, all of this that comes to pass is ordained by him, and trusting that he is good, that he is faithful. That I pray that we would find safety not in our deeds, not in our ability to to be good, but rather uh, in the in him who forgives. That we would find safety in him. That we would uh, that you would find safety in the one who prays for you, and pray through him. And that that's where refuge is found. And then how does this passage shape our view of Jesus? Uh, This passage inspires us to have a big view of Jesus, to who is the lion and the lamb. You know, uh, his prayers are effective because everything that that the temple is not, he is. You know, he he is the one uh, who is is faithful. Uh, He is the one who truly obeys the law in in every single aspect of it. Uh, he is the one who prays and the fig tree withers and the mountains move. He is the one who's powerful. Have faith in him. Trust in him. Uh, trust in him with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And that's our calling as Christians. That's, that's my prayer for you and for me and for all of us that we would trust in him and that we would experience his presence and his peace during this time. Let us now pray together and go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we reflect on Jesus' teaching 
in this passage. We pray that you would reveal to us the areas in our lives that need to be transformed. We confess that we too are prone to go through the motions of worship without genuinely praying and confessing our need for you. Like those who are busy buying and selling, we too can lose sight of what truly matters. Father, we pray that you would help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Give us faith to believe that he can move the mountains in our lives. He is able not only to provide, protect, and heal, but also to forgive and to change each one of us. May our faith be firmly fixed on him who is able to bring about your good and perfect plans. We pray all of this in his name. Amen.